This is just the beginning. Welcome to Creating Trust and Transparency Online. I'm Ina Fried, Chief Technology Correspondent for Axios, coming to you from my home in San Francisco. Thank you to Adobe for making these conversations possible. And thanks to you for joining us, whether you came via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, or via Axios.com. Thanks so much for being here. Please follow along using the hashtag Axios events, as well as the Twitter account at Axios. And over the next half hour, we are going to explore the future of the media landscape, a place where bad actors increasingly have sought to exploit fears with fake or manipulated information. We'll talk about what society needs to do and also how companies are creating trust and on transparency online through attribution and other techniques. Our first guest is a professor at UC Berkeley in the School of Electrical Engineering, Computer Sciences and Information, Dr. Hani Freed. Welcome, Hani. Good to be here. Good to see you again. So we hear a lot about deep fakes, this idea of very convincing information that looks like a real video or audio, but has been digitally manipulated. And they call this the era of deep fakes. My sense is we're actually not quite there, but it is around the corner. Can you talk about what deep fakes are and where we are and what's coming in the next little bit? Yeah, I think you got that right. I think we're we're getting close, but we're not quite there. So deepfakes, of course, is a general term for computer synthesized images, audio, or video. So there's a few places where I think we are basically there, which is, for example, the synthesis of images of people who don't exist um, or um, scenes that never existed. That is more or less there. The full-blown fake video, audio, uh, minute-long videos is getting very good. It's accelerating um, over the last 18 months, but you still need a fair amount of skill and time and, and, and effort to really nail it. But you can see what the trend is and that the trend is that the technology is getting better and better every few months, and eventually we will get there. Um, I think where the, the biggest risk that we are seeing with deepfakes today is in the form of non-consensual pornography, people taking the likeness of primarily women, putting it into sexually explicit material, and then distributing on the, on the internet. That is a very real today problem, not a hypothetical problem. Um, I think the other very real problem today is the plausible deniability argument where just because the notion of deep fakes exists, people can now say, well, it's fake, you can't believe it. And that, in many ways, I think is the real risk of what is to come, which is once we enter a world where everything could be fake, well, then nothing has to be real. And sort of, I think, really, we have this very limited window to sort of prepare for that world. So today, you can do deep fakes. They're fairly expensive. They're hard to do. So what we see is sort of manipulated video that's been cut or edited. And with a little bit of research, you know, experts can say, yeah, that was edited. Um, what we're headed towards is this world where you can't necessarily tell the difference. And as you point out, that creates two problems. One is this issue of the video might be fake. It might not be what it appears to be. And the other is because deep fakes exist when someone, particularly maybe a politician, has a video of them saying something they don't like, say Lindsey Graham doesn't like the video of him saying, watch this tape, hold me to it, he can say that's fake. Um, and today yeah. we have the evidence to say that's not fake, um, but in a year or two, we might not. Is that the world we need to be prepared for? I think we absolutely have to be prepared for it. And I would say we, we already have at least a foot in that world because of the echo chamber that is social media today, um, is that people can consume content that is consistent with their worldview. They're not being pushed um, to really think critically about things. They're not being pushed with fact checking because so much of news consumption is now happening on social media, which of course has very different standards than in Axios or in New York Times or any mainstream outlet. And so I think that it will only get worse as we have the ability to create sophisticated fake visual information. But I would argue we're already well on our way to getting there. And that's what is concerning to me is that the train has left the station. Um, and if we do not start thinking about this on many levels, I fear that these are existential threats to democracies and societies. And we've seen this. We have seen misinformation lead to horrific violence in Myanmar, Ethiopia, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, India, Brazil. We have seen misinformation disrupt global uh, democratic elections around the world. These aren't hypothetical threats of what will happen if we do not get a handle on mis- and disinformation online. 
And I want to spend most of our time talking about the solutions, what we should be doing, both governments and businesses and consumers. But, um, you know, I want to also give a sense of just how much the technology is likely to change. Today, it requires experts, a lot of technology. We're not that far, though, right, from a world where I can make anyone say anything, where someone's going to come up, particularly in audio, but eventually audio and video. And if it's a public figure, I can make anyone say anything, right? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you look, nobody likes to predict the future because it's very difficult to do, but you can see the trend. We are already starting to see apps and web pages where you can just do this without any skill whatsoever. You don't have to download a GitHub repository. You don't have to have a GPU. You don't need cloud computing. It's literally now going to start happening on your phone. And um, and what we are seeing at that level of full automation, ease of use, is troubling for the coming few years. And that kind of democratization of access to Hollywood-style video and audio editing is worrisome because we know it is going to be weaponized against individuals, societies, and democracies. Okay, so with that as the backdrop, we know we're going to be, that's the world we're going to be dealing with in very short order um, it seems like we could respond to that as by, you know, consumers becoming more media literate. It seems like we could have regulation. It seems like we could also have the tech companies and platforms taking more aggressive stands on manipulated media. What combination of those things do you think we need in order to combat the threat that you've described? Good. So I think you've exactly enumerated the things we have to do. So first and foremost, the platforms have to take misinformation on their platforms more seriously. We have seen over the last few years how horrific things are happening around the world because of misinformation, conspiracies, health issues around COVID. We have got to get more serious about the underlying policies at the Facebooks, the YouTubes, the Twitters, the TikToks, et cetera. No question about that. We have to stop the line of, I don't want to be the arbiter of truth. It is nonsense. Um, now, I would argue there's two things that have to be done in that space. One is you do have to deal with misinformation, figuring out what's right and what's not. And you may not want to do that, um, but you have a responsibility. But I would argue the bigger responsibility is on the algorithmic recommendation algor um, algorithms that are amplifying the most divisive, the most hateful, the most conspiratorial, the most outrageous, because that engages people and that maximizes profits. So the problem is not just that this content is on the platforms, it's that the Facebooks and the YouTubes and the Twitters of the world are actively amplifying that because they figured out that's what people want. Okay, so we have to think about and both have, of those issues. And we have seen some efforts on the algorithmic side to both YouTube and Twitter, I think, to sort of recognize borderline content, content that might not be totally violative of their rules, but that isn't good and sort of doing less recommending of it. But what we haven't seen as much is on the manipulated media front. You know, we're starting to see more manipulated media. Again, these days it's often just edited to produce something that really was said, but edited in such a way to make it appear as something else. And we haven't seen the platforms be very aggressive. How realistic is it if they don't take stronger action that a year or two from now, the, their sites like YouTube or Twitter are just flooded with video, some of which is fake, some of which is real, and there's no way for the average person to tell the difference? I, I think you're absolutely right. So first of all, you're right that some of the platforms have gotten a little better. Um, I think it took them a lot longer than I would have liked. I think it's not as quite as aggressive as I'd like, but there is some movements on some of the platforms. I completely agree with you that in the same reason why YouTube and Facebook banned legal adult pornography in their platforms because they were concerned that it would just swamp the platforms and nobody would want to go there, I think the same thing is going to start to happen around mis- and disinformation. It's the spam problem, is that you just pollute the ecosystem and eventually this is going to backfire. So I think for their own self-interest, they have to start getting more serious about this, if not for our self-interest around health issues uh, elections and the 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 insane conspiracies which are now being fueled online and then showing up in the real world with real world implications. One of the technology approaches that we've seen, and this isn't a cure all, but um, and you've been involved in this, Adobe's been involved in this, this idea of authenticated um, platforms where you know that the video hasn't been changed from capture through processing, through air. What role does that type of approach have to play and what are its limitations? Good. 
there, there's two basic ways to do authentication. Uh, one is called the passive approach, which is what we spend most of my time doing here in, at UC Berkeley, where content shows up and we try to analyze it. The other approach, and that's obviously very difficult, the other approach is what we call an active approach under what is, what is called a control capture environment. So you use a specialized uh, software app, just a different camera app on your phone, and at the point of recording, you reach in and you grab all the pixels and all the bits associated with whatever you recorded, plus the metadata, geolocation, date, time. You hash all of that. You extract a, a unique digital signature. You cryptographically sign it and put it onto some type of distributed immutable ledger like a blockchain. And then at any point in the future, the piece of content whose authenticity is being called into question, the signature will be compared to what was um, recorded at the time of the initial recording, and then you can authenticate downstream. In a sense, what you're doing is you're shifting the burden from me, the person receiving the content, to you, the person recording the content. In many ways, that makes perfect sense. So I like this technology because it scales. It's feasible today. It's not a pipe dream two, three years from now. Um, and it puts the burden on, on the people recording to that if you want to be trusted, then let's do that within a trusted ecosystem. And I really like these solutions. I think they will be eventually part of a larger solution that includes, as you said, better policy on the platforms, regulatory relief, and more education among the citizens on how to consume trusted information. So that's sort of a technology approach. And again, it's not a cure-all. With the limited time we have left, What's one thing you would like consumers to start thinking about? And what's one thing you'd like regulators to start thinking about and taking stronger action on? Good. So consumers, stop getting your news from social media. This is easy. Social media is not a place to get news. It is a place to connect with friends. Do what it was intended to and go back to trusted sources and be critical and careful and objective about how you consume information, number one. Number two for the regulators is stop going after the speech issue and start going after the reach issue. The issues here are not that bad content is being created and uploaded. It's that the platforms are actively promoting that and profiting from it. So I think we should focus our attention on this algorithmic amplification and go after the priorities of the companies to simply engage users, to extract more data from them, to deliver more ads. And I think if we go after that algorithmic amplification and how we are optimizing what we are feeding to the users, we can have a more reasoned debate about this balance between an open and free internet and um, protecting our societies and individuals. Well, thank you so much, Hani Fareed. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks so much. Great to talk to you again. Nice to see you. Thanks so much to our sponsor, Adobe. And up next, we have our View from the Top segment with Axios CEO Jim Vandehei and Adobe Executive VP, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary Dana Rao. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ina. It's now my pleasure to bring you a conversation uh, with Dana Rao, who is both the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Adobe. Thank you, uh, Dana, for being here. Thank you, Adobe, for making this conversation uh, possible. Uh, your mission, uh, what you're doing with the co uh, content authenticity initiative, can't think of like a more important thing right now, right? As we grapple with misinformation and disinformation, tell viewers what exactly the uh, initiative does. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thanks so much for having having us on here to talk about this initiative. It's, it's something we've been working on, it's for, and Adobe feels pretty passionately about. Um, we we two years ago at our Creative Creativity Conference Max we were um, demonstrating some of the power of AI editing, and that's what we do. We build the world's greatest creative tools. Um, and we thought about the problems some of the consequences of this technology. And one of them is you can make um, videos and images that, are, that can be very lifelike and very difficult for the users to, to understand what is true and what isn't true. And as we thought through that problem, we asked ourselves, what can we do? What's our responsibility to help um, address the effects of this technology? You're not putting the genie back in the bottle, right? You're not going to stop um, AI editing. You're not going to stop sophisticated video and creative people from doing what they do. Um, and frankly, 99% of creative content is there for the user's pleasure, right? For building worlds and unleashing imaginations and making great art. But there's always that 1% who are going to use tools like that for bad, right? To deceive people. And so we asked ourselves, what could we do? And there we, we thought a lot about 
could we use an AI detection system, a way to automatically detect if edits were being made to videos and images to deceive people? And we just didn't think that was the right long-term solution. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be an arms race from a technology perspective. So we thought about this, this content authenticity initiative, like how do we help the user understand what's real? And you do that by what? You work with Twitter, you work with the New York Times, and you're doing what to be able to uh, confirm that something is authentic? So what we do is, it's, it's, and, and that's a, I'm glad the way you phrased that, we aren't confirming things are true. We are revealing to the user what happened to that image. And so what we know as the inventors of Photoshop, we can help the creator create, uh, record all the edits they're making to an image or a video. And so when you create something, you capture a news story and you're making edits to it. If you want to be trusted, and that's the premise of the content authenticity initiative, it's a place for good actors to be trusted. And so if you want to be trusted, you record your edits in Photoshop and then you publish them a file to the New York Times. New York Times publishes that article with that video or image and Twitter picks it up and publishes it on their social media platform. You, the user, Jim, you're like, hey, I wonder if, if the president really did go to Brazil to look at that forest fire. You look at that image and you can click on a little file and it'll show you what happened to that image. So if there are major edits made to that, like, for example, maybe the president never went to Brazil, it'll show up in that history and you'll know that, that wasn't true. But we're going to leave it for the user to decide. That's, that's the key point there. We're just going to show you what happened, and then you decide whether or not you want to trust it. How worried should we be, should the viewer be, that bad actors are going to be able to manipulate photos or videos in a way that could affect the stock price or affect a political debate or, God forbid, like cause some kind of uh, mayhem because it spread so quickly? How worried? I think everyone should be concerned about this, right? The, the basis of, of a democracy is a shared understanding of facts. And this is why we care about this issue. If, if we can't agree on what the facts are, we can't do anything about policies like climate change or, or addressing any of the real issues of, the time, of our time. And it's pretty easy to edit videos and images and, and, and create a fiction um, from, from a fact. And the problem with images and video is people believe them. They believe them more than they do the written word. People just have an instinctive belief in it. So if you couple images and videos, fake images and videos, the targeting software, so you, you're trying to go for a specific audience, you can manipulate people. And that's, that's unfortunately what's going on right now. And it's only going to get worse as, as time goes on if we all sit and do nothing about it. But I think the good news is I think that there's a lot of people who are interested in this problem and are working hard to solve it. And it gets worse because the technology just gets better uh, on the end of what the person who has bad intentions might do. Like fast forward a couple of years, you spent a lot of time marinating this topic, obviously something of massive public global uh, concern. What is like, if we get this right, if we figure out some kind of protection system uh, where your initiative is a piece of it, what does the world look like? Like what does a safer content world look like where we're not as susceptible to manipulation? Yeah, we think there's three three pillars to this. One is detection. So we're hopeful that, you know, we're going to continue to invest in research on detection. Maybe there's an automated way for you to automatically know that something being shown to you is fake. We're not sure that's going to happen, but we're going to invest in that. Then there's education, Jim, and I think this is really important. Um, and we've, we've been working with the governments, the EU and the U.S. To, to, to help this. People need to understand they can't always trust what they see. Just like in fishing. Years ago, you might have gotten an email from a bank and you and it asked me for your social security number and you might have just typed it in and sent it away. You know better now. You know that some of these emails are fake, even if they have beautiful letterhead. People need to think about that way on online content. There needs to be an initial bit of skepticism in how they think about it. And the third solution in the world that you're imagining five years from now is that if you want to be trusted, Jim wants to have his new support trusted, he's going to have a logo on it. That's going to say content authenticity or whatever it is. And then the user is going to say, oh, that person decided to reveal what happened to their video. I'm either going to trust them because they bothered to do that, or I'm going to look for myself and decide for myself. And so you're going to be able to say, at least this group of people has decided to be trusted. Anything I get that isn't processed through this, maybe I should be a little more skeptical. Who governs that? Like in yours, yours again, like it's the beginning of a much bigger initiative. It sounds like in yours, it's you know, it's sort of the, it's putting it on the user to be able to make the decision. It's it's corporations, companies working together. Ultimately, does government 
have to step in and sort of impose this across all platforms? Yeah, I think that it's not necessary yet to think about a government mandate because these are tricky issues. But the, what we're proposing and what we're working with a bunch of different collaborators on is an open standard. We, The media companies, the social media platforms, and the technology companies all have a vested interest in getting this way. We need a place for, for, for content to be trusted. If no one trusts any content anymore, this is that, that's bad for everyone. So it's an open standard. Everyone can use the same platform that we're talking about. It's free. And we're hopeful that a voluntary adoption, because it's the right thing to do, and it's also good for their business models, um, will actually be the driving force behind this. It's amazing. Such a sign of the times that we have to have a discussion, right, about whether or not the even the definition of truth and the protections of truth. But it does sound like the initiative uh, starts to uh, put a layer up there, which, which can help uh, restore truth. And obviously, us in the media have a big uh, role in that. Uh, Dana, uh, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Thank you to Adobe for making it uh, possible uh, and love to check in uh, from time to time to see how uh, this project works and how other people in the media uh, can get involved. So thank you. And back to you, Ian. Thanks, Tim. Our next guest is the Disinformation Fellow at the Wilson Center, Nina Jankowitz, who's joining us from Arlington, Virginia. Hi, Nina. Hi, Ina. Great to be with you. So one of the things about living in this moment is there are a lot of scary things that are legitimately happening. And then there's the impact of around COVID, around election uncertainty, around all this. There's just this general hard to discern truth. And how important is the chaos aspect of disinformation and the aspect of not just proactively distributing false information, but just making it harder for us to trust all the information around us? How big a role does that play? Well, I think particularly when we're looking at Russian actors, that is one of the biggest goals that the Kremlin has, uh, instilling that chaos, instilling doubt and distrust in our democratic systems uh, benefits the Kremlin, frankly, because it allows them to keep the scales tipped, uh, keep us distracted at home so that we're not paying attention to what the Kremlin is doing and it's near abroad. But it also benefits domestic disinformers as well. Um, and in the case that we're seeing right now ahead of the US election, it is instilling distrust in our democratic system in the fact that people's votes, uh, the, their idea that their votes might not be counted, that they can't trust in local and state officials or federal officials. And all of that has a huge effect not only on our day-to-day -day lives, on public safety, public health in the COVID era, but it ultimately has an effect on how the, our democracy functions. Um, and that's going to be a much longer effect than anything on or after November 3rd. We're going to be fighting against that you know, for years to come. Because people actually may look at all this and say, my vote might not count, you know, and get dispirited. And that is sometimes the goal of adversaries both here and abroad, it sounds like. Totally. Uh, we've seen that, you know, in the 2016 election, we saw Russia uh, kind of amplifying discord and discontent on both sides of the political spectrum. This isn't necessarily about one party or another. And we've seen them do that abroad as well in places like Ukraine and Estonia, where they're taking societal fissures and exploiting them and amplifying, again, to turn societies against one another and ultimately undermine the functioning of our democracies. And from talking to you and other folks that really spend a lot of time in this area, one of the things that's been surprising has been not that there has been this level of interference, because we kind of known that for a while, but the degree to which uh, people domestically, and in this case in America, are doing the work for them, that once they get uh, a little bit of discord going, it's amazing how far legitimate people uh, are spreading that disinformation. How much do you see the spread of falsely started but legitimately spread information. I think that's one of the main tactics of disinformers in 2016, you know, or in 2020, I'm sorry. In 2016, we saw a lot of inauthentic amplification through networks of trolls and bots. But in 2020, especially because there is greater awareness on behalf of the public, the government, the social media platforms about these tactics, what we're seeing is information laundering instead. So a good example of this, of course, is the, the narrative surrounding uh, Ukrainian interference 
in the 2016 election, which is a complete conspiracy theory, almost certainly planted by Russia uh, through some influential Ukrainians who spoke to influential people in the GOP. And then that information was laundered, uh, was legitimized in our media and in the halls of Congress, frankly. That's how information laundering works. But it's not only political like that. Uh, We've also seen Russia very recently, just in September, use information laundering through the peace data operation, which the viewers may recall. Uh, Essentially, the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force tipped off Twitter and Facebook that there was an internet research agency associated uh, organization called Peace Data claiming to be a news outlet that was hiring actual American freelance journalists to write left-leaning articles on their site. And then rather than using those inauthentic accounts, trolls, bots to amplify that narrative, uh, these articles were just dropped in Facebook groups, which are a great attack vector for an organization like the IRA, because these people are primed uh, for vulnerability. They are associated around vulnerability, whether they're into alternative health or whether they are supporters of Julian Assange or other, you know, kind of fringe ideas. Uh, These are, again, perfect people who are going to be just interested in the things that uh, these groups are, are seeding and they don't really know where it's coming from. It looks like a legitimate news operation and it's amplified organically through the infrastructure of our social media platforms. So that's how the information laundering is working. Um, And it's certainly one of the most important tools in the disinformation toolkit, whether we're looking at foreign or domestic sources in 2020. So if that's the landscape of the threats we're facing, what can we do as a society, as individuals? What's the role? What should we see from legislation? What do we need to do as individuals to be more media savvy? And then ultimately, what uh, do the platforms themselves need to do to be better uh, stewards of truth? Well, I think one thing is certain, we can't just continue playing whack-a-troll because our adversaries, again, whether they're foreign or domestic, know that it's really easy to create these inauthentic accounts and the return on investment for them is pretty big. Um, Instead, we need to look at more systematic whole of society approaches to countering disinformation, including building up media and digital literacy campaigns, not only for school age children, but for the voting age population as well. You know, elderly people who are used to having mainstream media curate their news for them don't really have the reflexes in place to have skepticism toward the information they see on social media. So we need to really figure out ways that the government can can fund and create those activities and systematically reach Americans who might be vulnerable to that sort of exploitation, giving Americans the tools that they need to navigate today's information environment. But there is a role for the platforms and certainly for Congress to play in all of that as well. I think we're seeing um, an inclination now from the platforms to give users more context, more transparency around the information that we're seeing and why we're being targeted most partic- most, uh, most importantly. But uh, one thing that I think the platforms might need to be compelled to do is more oversight and transparency around harmful content. We know that what is engaging on social media is often what is enraging. And I think platforms need to be instilled to have a duty of care, not only for their users and their personal information, but for our democracy writ large and, and the ways that the conversations happening on the platforms affect that democracy. And that's where Congress needs to step in to make sure that, you know, the the conversations that we're having are conversations that not necessarily are based in fact. I don't want Congress policing that, but I do think what we need is that oversight and transparency so users know why they're being targeted. They know where the information is coming from, particularly when we're talking about things like political ads. That's that's crucial. And so far, we're letting the platform self-police and we know that they have their economic interests at heart. And that's where government needs to step in. Yeah, I mean, we hear a lot from the Facebooks of the world saying we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. At the same time, it seems like it's their platforms that so many people are using, rightly or wrongly, to inform themselves. So it seems like the uh, hands-off approach of anything goes and we'll let people decide. It seems like we have enough evidence at this point to say, well, that approach isn't working. Is that your sense? Yeah, you know, I think um, especially the the revelations that have come out this summer about the ways 
that in particular Facebook's rules are inconsistently applied um, show the need for oversight. And I think this, if we do create some sort of body to do this, it should be an expert body, uh, one that is apolitical entirely, that again is just conducting oversight, making sure that the the platforms are adhering to the terms of service uh, that they are putting forward, that there are no voices that are being privileged over other voices, no voices that are being, uh, you know, censored over other voices, because we're, we've been seeing that in particular with with minority communities, communities of color, that the AI in particular can't can't keep up uh, with, you know, the 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 way that those communities communicate. Um, and that is a very scary thing. Um, so I think we we need some advocacy on behalf of users here. Um, and again, I think the social media platforms also have a role to play in educating users. I love um, this new feature that Twitter has been testing with a pop up uh, surrounding uh, articles that may not have been opened before users retweet them. They saw 40% of users in their test of that feature actually open the link before retweeting it. Those sorts of uh, friction opportunities are really good to slow down the spread of information because uh, the scale and the amount of information that we're dealing with is one of the biggest and most difficult problems. And you know, short of hiring content moderators uh, in the millions, um, we need to introduce ways to slow that information down and to give people the context they need, again, for the information that they're consuming. So that's what social media companies need to do. We all need to think more broadly about the resilience of our societies, not just eradicating the bad content, but giving people the tools that they need to make better decisions about the content that they're consuming online, understand Understanding what their reflexes need to be in the social media era. And it does seem as challenging as this moment is, and there's a flood of disinformation and misinformation, it really does sometimes feel overwhelming. But if anything, from talking to technologists and people that study the field, we're actually in this moment before we're literally flooded with fakes, digital fakes of photos and audios and videos that will make it even harder. How important is it that we figure out how to respond now versus a year or two from now. Well, I think, you know, we've already lost precious time because of the politicization of this issue. And especially those generational responses that I talk about, that I talked about before, they're really important that we get those moving now because that resilience takes years to build and we are already on the back foot, unfortunately. So we all need a call to arms. Let 2020 be the last time we're in this situation and we're not actively building a more resilient, equitable online discourse. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nina Jankowitz, who has a new book out on uh, the spread of misinformation. Uh, thank you for taking the time, uh, and thanks for joining Axios. It's my pleasure, Ina. And thank all of you for joining us for another virtual conversation that's made everyone, I hope, a little bit smarter, faster. Thank you to Adobe for making the conversation possible. And for the latest news, uh, tune in to Axios.com or the Axios app for your mobile device. And you can sign up for the newsletter that I help uh, write, log in, or any of our newsletters at signup.axios.com. And stay tuned tomorrow for another event, News Shapers, America's Road Ahead, reacting to yesterday's presidential debate and the latest news of the day. Thank you all for joining. See you on axios.com. For Axios, I'm Ina Freed.